Father God, we come to you and we thank you for your word, Lord. We pray that you'd open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to see you, to see your, the importance of your word, that you'd help us to eat of you and drink of you, Lord, and that we'd find all that we have, all that we are, and everything we ever hope for in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my sermon title is The Engrafted Word, and as I'm back at there, and I believe God's revealing a few things to start off with before I actually get to my message, but you know, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that it gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And people use this scripture. But I think you could change it just slightly to get a point across. For God so loved the world that He sent His Word in the flesh, that whosoever will take Him at His Word and believe on Him shall not perish and have everlasting life. So the love of God sent Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, for our own sanity, for our own salvation. You know, if you look at what sin did to man in the Garden of Eden, they were one, husband and wife. They, they didn't see anything wrong with each other. They had all the animals. They were, they were protected. They had, a, they had it really good. And all of a sudden, at the drop of a hat, sin came into their hearts, and all of a sudden, they wanted to sell each other out at the drop of a hat. And that's what sin did. Then, Cain killed his brother Abel. And if you read the Bible over and over and over again, sin destroyed, sin polluted, sin corrupted, sin caused people to do stuff that you don't even want to read the portions in the Bible where it happened. And Jesus says, I came to save the people from their sin. And that was love at Acts. And that was the word, the love of God shown in his word for our sakes. James 1.21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and subfluity of naughtiness. Don't want anything to do with it. Leave it behind. Get rid of it. Run from it. Be, hate it. It says, and receive with a, a spirit of being teachable, of being humble, and saying, Lord, even if I don't understand your word, your word is true. Help me to believe it. Help me to live it. Help me to obey it. Be like the disciple says, who else has the words of life? Jesus, we might be messes and we might realize it. We might, but we, we, you know, we might not even realize how much mess are because we're arguing about who's going to be the grace in the kingdom when you're about to go to the cross. But they did know one thing. They knew they needed Jesus and they knew they needed his word. They said, who else has the words of life? And he says, wherefore, lay apart all this ungodliness and filthiness and subfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. See, when mankind was created god put a divine operating system in us an operating system of love of kindness of peace of joy of goodness he made us a wonderful creation he said he looked at all of his creation and he said it was good and that included man and all of a sudden the devil came in with some kind of virus that started rewriting the code rode us into nightmares into monsters into all these darkness things and god came and says i'm going to re-enter re some code here First, I'm going to pay the price because you were bought by sin. You were bought by the devil. He owns you now. I'm going to rip my program, my human being, my male and my female, and I'm going to rip it out of the devil's hands. And he says, now I'm going to give you some new programming to where you can recover that good and acceptable and perfect divine nature and character of Jesus Christ. And James 1, through 27, and it continues, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. He says, once you receive the word, once you believe the word, act on it. Don't just say, well, I believe it, it's true, and don't do anything with it because he says you'll be deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He looks into the word and says, okay, this is the nature of God. This is not God. This is, this is love. This is bitterness. This is, he sees what's wrong with him, but he sees what's right with God. And he sees that the answer is in God. But he says, At for, that for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. He goeth his way. He goeth and does his things. And he straightway forgetteth what man or man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of freedom, of love, of hope, of joy, of grace, of victory, of liberty, and continue with therein like the disciples did. Lord, we have no one else. We've got to continue following. We've got to continue in your word. And continue with the therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of this work, this man shall be blessed indeed. I will say it this way. You have to continue to look at Jesus Christ. You have to continue to look at the word of God 
or else you won't even know where you're supposed to be going. It's like the old days where you had to open a map or even with the GPS. Unless you keep on looking at the map, unless you keep on looking at the GPS, you will get lost. Life is much more complicated, much more messy than a Route 30 or a Route 97 or a, or a Pennsylvania, uh, the one where you pay for it. Uh, what does they call that? Turnpike. So life is much worse than even the worst part of Chicago or one of these major cities. And unless our eyes are on Jesus and are on his word, and then we act on his word, just like unless you keep your eyes on the map and then you follow the directions of that map or GPS, you will get lost. You will be a mess. You will have problems. And if we look at the modern day church, that is exactly what we see. We see anger, we see bitterness, we see lust, we see confusion, we see hatred, we see all these darkness because we are not singly-eyed in Jesus and his word and we're not allowing God to reprogram us, to cleanse us, to wash us, to allow that word to be engrafted in us to where we are new creatures, new programmed in Christ. And he says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to have Christ, seem to be, have the truth, and bright is not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religion is vain. But somebody who seems to know God, but they always saying weird stuff, they're not agreeing with the word of God, they're not, a, they're not submitting to the word of God. He says their religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, will lead and bring you to this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself from spotted from the world, laying aside the filthiness and the subfluity of naughtiness and receiving with meekness the engrafted word. Hebrews 8, 8 through 12 says, For finding fault with him, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, while I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. If you, look, if you read the Old Testament, he's always saying, I set before you today blessings and cursings. If you will continue my word, then I will bless you. You will, you will prosper. You will stay in your land. Everything will continue to grow. You'll, you're, you'll be prosperous. Your kids, you'll see your kids' kids. You'll have long life. He says, you'll never leave this place of prosperity, this place of happiness, this place of peace, this place of joy, this place of goodness. But he says, if you don't continue in my word, if you don't continue in my commandments, he says, then you're going to go after other gods. He says, then you're going to do the exact same thing of the people I kicked out of this land. He says, you will even be worse than these people. And that's what happens to Christians when we don't continue in the word. Because if you study New Testament, it says continue in my word. It says hide the word in my heart. It says um, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It says as a branch, if you don't stay detected to Jesus, you will shrivel up to die and you'll be cast into fire and you'll be burned. So it's the same in the Old Testament, New Testament, but now Christ has come into our life. He has severed the chains that bind us. He has given us a new spirit. He's written the word, and it's about to say it here. He says, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, and we are now been part, become part and parcel with the house of Israel. He says, I will break down that middle wall of partition between them, and they'll be one. They're talking about the Jews and the Gentiles who believe in Christ. He says, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them in their heart, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. He says, I will show my love to you. I will give you my word. And I will write it in your heart. I will write it in my mind. I'm going to inoculate you with a divine vaccine against every sickness and illness that the devil just throws at you. I'm going to give you a program that will fight, that will not allow the devil to corrupt your hard drive, will heart your mind, your life, that will protect you against anything the devil throws at you. And he says, And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. And that's how, what Christians are supposed to be. We're all supposed to be loving God and loving neighbor. We're all supposed to have the nature and character of God. We're all supposed to be able to lay hands on the sick and they recover, cast demons out. We've, you know, it says, he says, you won't no longer look to some man or something for a truth. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, because they're supposed to help us get to that place. But he's saying you will no longer have to look to a man to overcome, to have victory in Jesus Christ. 
But, he said, but that's what's happened in the modern church. They're always look, oh, did you hear what so-and-so said? Did you hear what so-and-so said? Oh, that was such a good mess. Where's getting in the word? Where's abiding in him and him abiding in us to where God can lead us and direct us and God, uh, to where we can be flames of fire wherever we go? And he says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities while I remember no more. He says, I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to cleanse them. I'm going to cut that off. And they're going to be new pe- creatures in me. Proverbs 2, 1 through 5 says, My son, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, if you will take a hold of my word and hide it in your heart, in your mind, in your life, in every area, he says, so thou shalt climb thy ear unto wisdom. Whenever somebody preaches the truth, you'll be listening. Whenever God's spirit comes to you and says, this is the way, walk ye in it. This isn't of God, or that was wrong, you need to repent. He says, you will clear your ear to that truth, to that wisdom, and apply thine heart to knowing and understanding the will of God. Yea, if thou criest and seekest after knowledge, and lifted up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, you know, Jesus told the parable of the kingdom of God being like the treasure hidden in the field of the pearl of great price. They got a hold of Jesus. They got a hold of the truth. They got a hold of the word, and they said, oh, yeah, I found out that everything else I've been looking at and pursuing is nothing but a false bill of goods. It's fool's gold. And they said, they sell everything to get it they sell everything to they seek god that's why the old church in acts when they got a hold of jesus when they got a hold of his word they sold everything they didn't need and laid it at the apostles feet and the apostles didn't misuse it because they discovered that the word of god that jesus christ was the treasure hidden in the field they discovered everything else was worthless that's why paul could say i count everything else but dung and he says then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Then thou will, you know, then you will fear the Lord. I, I'm not watching that. I'm not saying that. I'm not doing that. I mean, God has set me free. God has shown me his love. God has given me his grace. God's given me his nature, his character. Why would I want that? You will fear the Lord and you will depart from evil and you will know the will, the nature, divine will of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, remember what Jesus said. Remember what Jesus did. Remember what the word says. Say, Lord, I trust in you, what you said. And he will direct your path. Proverbs 6, Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And he says, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to, buckler to them to walk uprightly. He, he'll lead you and guide you. He'll protect you. He keepeth the path of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then next verse. Then shalt thou understand what is right. Then thou shalt understand what is just. Then thou shalt understand what is equal and fair. Yea, every good path you will know. He says, when wisdom enters into thy heart, and knowledge of the word of God and his will is pleasant unto thy soul. Discretion shall preserve thee. You will know what the will of God is. You won't be deceived. Understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man. In the New Testament, it talks about that you'll no longer be tossed to and fro about F where they lie and wait to deceive with all kinds of false doctrines. He says you'll no longer be hearkening to the men who are trying to use you. There's people in, the, in pulpits that aren't there because they love God. They're there to get money or fame or some other thing. They're trying to use people. And he says, it'll deliver you from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, powerful things, arrogant things, de- deceitful things, who leave the path of uprightness to walk in the way of darkness, who says that we're right with God, but we're going to walk in freedom. We're going to walk in darkness. We're going to walk in sin because that is freedom. Are they nuts? That'd be like somebody, Jesus, let's say Jesus came to you and freed you from cancer and you're like, well, devil's over here. Hey, you want some cancer back? You want some cancer back? And if you could physically walk over and receive cancer back from the devil, who in their right mind would do so? No one. But it's the same way with sin, except worse, because sin leads to all the other things. And he says, who rejoice to do that which is evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they are forward in their path. And he says, in this word, this truth that you got it in your heart, you got it in your life, he says, it will deliver you from the strange woman, even from the stranger with flatter with, with her words, who forsaketh the God of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her path unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they the hold of the paths of life. Psalms 119, one through six says, 
Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord, who walk in his word. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, who, who look at the Bible and they see what God did for people when they did it rightly, or see what happens when people walk in wickedness, what the corrupt. Man, if you listen or read the Old Testament over and over again, you see somebody blessed of God, it's because they did his commandments. You see somebody who didn't do it, it you, you sit there, there was a king, um, you know, Solomon, he, he, he went away from God and then his son was asked, are you going to make our burden lighter? And he said, and he, he went to the younger ones and he says, yeah, I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to sting you. So 10 tribes left and they, they went to this other guy who God had prophesied would become the king of Israel. And God told him, if you have the heart of David, if you keep my commandments, you keep my law, he says, I will bless you like I did David. I will establish your kingdom. So what did he do? Because he was afraid to his people, his people, his power, his authority, his prosperity would go to God for what they wanted. They would go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. He thought he would lose his people. They weren't his people. They were God's people. He set up two golden calves and started worshiping the same thing that happened at e you know, where the Hebrew children came out of Egypt. How stupid can you get? I mean, if you read what happened to the people in the wilderness over the calves, but that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what sin does to people's hearts and minds. I mean, it's like they go nuts. And that one act of his led to Israel. Oh man, almost every single one of their kings was crazy. And it set up Jezebel. It set up, hey, uh, forget the Jezebel spirit. I mean, the, that spirit of disobedience that didn't take a hold of the word of God gave room to all that crap. And he says, blessed are they that keep his testimonies who know what happens to people if they obey or if they don't, and that seek him with their whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy word, all thy commandments. Then it goes on. I will praise thee with an uprightness of heart when I have learned thy truth, when I have learned thy righteous judgment. He says, I will praise you with a pure heart when I know your word, when I know your will, when it's live to me, when it's real to me. And he says, you know, people say, we need to praise God, we need to praise God, but what are we supposed to praise God out of, out of a clean heart, out of a pure heart, out of an upright heart, out of knowing his word, out of knowing who he is? And he says, I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly, Wherewith shall a young man, or you could say young woman or old man, old woman, it doesn't matter. He says, wherewith shall a person cleanse his way? Where can you get to this place of blessing? Where can you get to this place of victory? Where can you have the heart of David when he was walking uprightly before the Lord? He says, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Jesus says he loved the church and he gave himself for it that he might cleanse it and wash it with the wadding of the water by the word. So it's the same in the Old and the Old New Testament, except now that we have Jesus in our heart, we have his word engrafted in our heart, we have this word engrafted in our mind, as we surrender to it, it'll take a hold and it'll produce fruit and we can become one with God. They couldn't do that in the Old Testament. Sin was separating them. Even the ones who were seeking God, who God could only work with them, he had to put, even after the death, he had to put them in a place, Abraham's bosom, because they couldn't be in the sight of God, because sin cannot before God he says this heavens themselves are filthy before God how much more man who drinks up sin like like water and he says thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee thy word have I hid in my heart that I know your love your goodness your mercy your joy your life that I will know that you know best that I may follow you that I may abide in you that I may hope in you that I may glorify and honor your name and that's why he, that's why David could praise and create all those psalms because he had the word of God so burning in his heart he just couldn't help it he'd break out in song I mean if somebody real you know I just thought of this if somebody really made a true adaptation of David it could be he'd be in the battlefield and he'd be like, oh, I've been work fighting all day long. And all of a sudden he'd just break out in song singing about God, singing about uh, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. He's probably breaking out in song right in the middle of the battlefield, right in the middle of washing his clothes, right in the middle of dinner because the word of God was burning in his heart so strongly. Romans 12, one through two says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, 
by the mercies of God, how good God is, his love, his long suffering, his kindness, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says that you just say, I'm giving my heart, my mind, all that I am to God, that in a place of holiness and righteousness, wherefore laying apart all that filthiness and subfluity of not. He says, surrendered unto God, he says, which is reasonable because he gave himself for us. He made us there for him. Then he gave us his son. He's blessed us. He's been good to us. It's, it makes sense. What else would you do to such a good God? He says, it's reasonable. And he says, but don't let the devil get a hold of you and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Continuous looking in that mirror of Jesus Christ, continuing looking in that mirror of his word, of his nature and character to where you will know his will, you will know the truth, and it will make sure not only how are you free, but you will stay free. John 8, 31 to 32 says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Then are you my friends indeed. Then are you the ones I love indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, teaching them every single word that I spoke, all the examples that I showed you. Make sure they hear and know the truth. Make sure the word that's in you that I gave you, I planted in the last three and a half years, is now in them that they may have the same life that you have. And he says, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. John 8, 33, 37. They answered, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. Once again, that's what the flesh says. We don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I'm perfect. I'm good. There's nothing wrong with me. Look in the mirror once. I mean, ask your wife, ask your father, ask your son, ask your daughter, ask your brother, your sister, ask your neighbor. Do I have problems? Well, they're going to tell you. You definitely do, because we all do. And he says, Jesus answered him, Truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, whosoever sinneth, committeth sin, is a slave of sin, become burdened, become slave, bondage to it. And the servant or the slave abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free by his word, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word had no place in you. John 17, 14 through 23 says, I have given them my word and the world hateth them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. We are not of this world when we take his word in our heart and our mind and our life. We get different programming. We get, we're totally new creatures. We're strangers and pilgrims. We're not of this world. We're, we're space cadets to most people. You know, Jesus says the message of Jesus Christ and his cross and his word and his will, he says to the Gentiles, it's, it makes no sense. It's foolish shouting. Pick up your cross and follow me. Love the Lord thy God. Uh, 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 be a servant of all. Uh, uh, you know, uh, don't work, care about money. Does, you can't serve God and mammon. All this stuff, it, it means, well, what are you talking about? What's wrong with you? You're supposed to make sure you lay up wealth. You're supposed to, you know, make sure you have a good job. You're supposed to make sure you have a good house. You make sure you're a good car. Make sure you have a reputation. Make sure you have all these things. And to them, it's nuts. And then it says to the Jews, it's a stumbling block because they don't believe in Christ, because they don't believe they need Jesus. They, they're trying to do it in their own strength. And he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shalt keep them from the evil. Once again, that they won't have that filthiness, the fluidity of naughtiness. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Separate them, cleanse them, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. I take a hold of the word. He, Jesus himself, in the Old Testament, it says he will eat honey and drink. I can't remember exactly how it says it, but he says that he may know to take a hold of that which is good and refuse that which is evil. But you know, what's, it's, there's a section of scripture verse right after that. It says, but, those, but before that happens, he says, because my people did not take my word, he says, there will no longer be kings. They're going to lose their land. And it's right there. And, you know, 
they never, I never connected those two. Jesus says, I, I'm going to send them my word. But before that happens, the people who didn't take a hold of my word are going to lose everything. And he says, as thou hast sent me in the world, so have I sent them in for the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The word that I have given them, they will give to others. And that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art me, and I in thee. He says that when you take my word in your heart, in your mind, in your life, you'll become one with me. And as others take that, they'll become one with me. That's why the Bible says a one heart, a one mind, to where they'll know you're my disciples because of your love for one another. Because we all have the same divine code in our heart and our mind which is Jesus and his word. But without that, we're like the shriveled up branch that the devil throws into bitterness, anger, lust. They offended me. I won't go to church for the next 40 years. All these things because we don't have Jesus and his word in our heart and our life. He says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art me, and I indeed, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they also may be one, even as we are one. The glory that God gave us, you know, in John 1, 4, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this glory was a victory over sin, a victory over whatever the devil of the world could send us. And it was the truth living in our hearts. And then the next verse, it says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it and wash it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, this section of Scripture verse, it's really powerful. It's from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 14. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He, his, his blessings, his judgments, everything about God, he, that's all him. And he said, then he says, And thou shalt love all that the Lord thy God is with all that you are, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words, this commandment, this word, this Bible, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt keep it. Hide it in your heart. You shall write it upon your heart. And you know, back then they didn't have, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the promises. They didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the Holy Spirit and Jesus in their heart. So he says, but even we have to do this. And he says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. That's why the Bible says, raise up a child and when they go and when they're old, they will not depart from it. The reason we have a whole bunch of people in the church who are departing from the truth is because they don't really have the truth. We got them caught up in sports. We got them caught up in movies. We got them caught up in all kinds of other things except the word and the heart and the mind of God. And if you've done that, there is forgiveness. But this is what we should be preaching from the pulpit, therefore, because I've heard people say stuff like, well, you know, they don't come out and say it. But if you read between the lines, they're saying, well, that verse isn't true because my kids went astray. They don't literally say it, but if you listen to what comes out of their mouth, you can hear it. There was one time we were sitting down with an evangelist and they were saying, they were saying, you know, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. So they were telling this lady, don't put your kids in school. Man, she got upset and it was a preacher because there's nothing wrong with public schools. There's nothing wrong with putting your kids and letting the world teach them. Are we crazy? Why would you give the devil your kids? I'm sorry, that's what you're doing. And we do it when we sit them in front of the TV. We do them, you know, the church gets caught up in saying, well, Harry Potter or this or that, that, this is demonic. No, all of it is. It's not like Harry Potter's worse than this or that or this or that. It's all corrupt. It all pollutes. It all is a distraction. David says, I have not lifted up my soul unto vanity. He says, you know, uh, be not conformed to this world. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't give your heart. Don't give your mind to the things of this world. Because it all comes from a place of darkness. And he says, shall be in thy heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house 
When you're in your house, you don't need to be sitting around the table talking politics. We've been guilty of it. You don't need to be sitting around the house and talking about uh, sports teams or this or that. He says, you need to be talking about God. You need to be talking about Jesus. You need to be talking about his word. When you're in a home, you know, so a lot of people were one person in public and another person at home. He says, no, start from your home. Be God, be Jesus, be his word at home first. And then he says, and when thou walkest by the way, when you're going to work or when you're riding in the car with your family or when you're walking apart, talk about Jesus, talk about his word. And then he says, and when thou liest down, and this, you know, if people lay, they put their kids to sleep and they'll read them a fairy tale. Why not read them about Jesus? Why not read them about the word of God? Do you want them looking to the world for their hope, for their entertainment, for their, for their future? You're saying, you, the only way you can get some excitement or hope, some passion is in the world. Because I've heard Christians say, well, I need some R&R. &R. So a lot of times when they say that kind of thing, they want to go sit down in front of a television or something. And we've all probably been guilty of it. But he says, when you go to rest, that's another time to get in the word. He says, eat his flesh, drink his blood. He says, don't, don't let rest in the world. And then he says, and when thou risest up, when you first get up in the morning, Jesus, his word, his will. See, this is why the disciples, I think, left Jesus, the 70. Because Jesus, I think they must have had some understanding of this because he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they said, oh, Lord, this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? Instead of saying, God, my flesh screams out. My mind screams out. My, my, uh, my TV series screams out. My YouTube screams out. My movies scream out. Everything I'm involved in screams out. You gotta watch me. You gotta continue with me. You can't give me up. And he says, but the disciples says, God, we might have issues, but we need you. We need your word. They, they had the right heart. And he says, and he says, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. Whatever you do, do heartily unto the Lord, not unto men, knowing of the Lord you receive inheritance. And he says, and they shall be frontless between thine eyes. Jesus says, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house. Every part of your life shall be founded upon Jesus and his word. And on thy gates, whatever you let in your heart, should let in your eyes, let in your ear gates. If somebody's gossiping to you, hey, I'm sorry, I can't listen to that. If somebody, like my dad, when he was at work site, if somebody starts swearing, he'd say, bless you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus. He'd just start praising God. And they're like, they look at him like, what's wrong with you? And they're like, well, God, he said, well, if you can curse Jesus, I can praise him. And he says, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. He's going to bless you, and it's not because of how good you are, it's because of how good he is. And he says, house is full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells dig, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten them be full, when you are blessed and everything's going great. He says, then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, which saved you from your sin, which forgave you, which cleansed you, which set you free, which blessed you beyond, who took your mess of a life and made you something a lot better. He says, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Ye shall not go after the world or the things of the world or other gods or the gods of the people which are round about you. And then you skip forward to verse 24 and it says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes or to keep his word, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. This is once again the love of God. For God so loved the world, he gave us Jesus, he gave us the living word. He gave the, he gave the Old Testament people, the Hebrew children, the word of God to keep them from becoming corrupt, from, from to burning their own kids as sacrifice, from going after all kinds of wickedness, from, from murder, from all this evil. And he's done the same for us. And he says that he might preserve us alive as is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us a righteousness of God by faith, but faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And without doing the word of God, we're deceiving ourselves. John 15, one through 11 says, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Everyone who won't take a hold of my word, he says, they'll be taken away. Now that doesn't mean as long as they're alive, they can't get right with God because 
um, Paul was talking to the, Jew, the Gentiles and he says, don't boast, against, don't boast against that God has grafted you into the vine because you can be broken off. And he says, the Jews, if they believe, they can be grafted back on. And he says, but in every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. Once again, lay aside all filthiness, stability, and naughty. Receive with meekness the engrafted word that God may be able to cleanse you and wash you and purge you. And he says, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean. Now you're able to be purged. Now you'll be able to become more like Christ through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. And then if you a few more verses, which get to in a, in, a, in a sec, it says, abide in me, my words abide in you. So abide in me, let my words abide in you. And I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you live and dwell and have your life in me. He says, I am the vine. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, ye are the branches. You grow from me. The love comes from me. My, the peace comes from me. The joy comes from me. And he says, I, he says, he that liveth and dwelleth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. He loses the love. He loses the peace. He loses the joy. He loses the grace of God. And he says, and men or the world will get them up and cast them into the fire and they will be burned with all kinds of unholy fires, whether it be anger, bitterness, despair, hopelessness, all these things, they'll be burned with them. If a man abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein, in abiding in Christ, abiding in God, and abiding, having his word abiding you, the Father is glorified, and you will bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. If you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will produce much fruit. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Once again, we talked about how the love of God gave us his word. And he says, I have loved you. Continue me in my love. If you keep my commandments... If you keep my word, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So we can't even know the love of God without the word of God because the devil's always whispering in our ear, you know, you can't overcome, he doesn't care for you, he won't take care of you, you know, you've done too much. All these devil's lies, we won't even be able to keep realizing the love of God without the word of God. And then we can't continue to walk in his nature and character and let, because Jesus says, you, you're of your father, the devil, because you're less of your father, you do. And he says, you're going to, you know, those who do such things will not inherit eternal life. He says, I, I don't know you, you, you who committed, uh, you know, who are involved in sin. So we can't love God. We can't continue in his love without the word of God. And he says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things, these truths about abiding in me and I abiding in you, about abiding in me and my words abiding in your heart and your mind, have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And if you go to the chapter before, it says, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tasks, trials, and tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. But you can't have that peace. You can't have that joy. You can't have that cheer. You can't have that victory if you don't continue in Jesus and his word. 1 Timothy 4, 13 through 16 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. He says, continue in the word of God. Continue reading it. Continue encouraging yourself. Continue studying it that you may know the will of God. And he goes on, neglect not the gift that is in thee. God has called you to preach. God has called you to teach. He says, don't neglect this, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, the word, the nature, the character, the will, the commandments of God. Give thyself wholly, completely, entirely to them that thy profiting may appear unto all. And he says, take heed unto thyself. Make sure you're walking in the will of God and unto the word of God. He says, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And then Matthew 7, 1 through 5. And we all hear people, especially in the world, they'll, they'll use this when, you come, when you're trying to, teach them about you know or do you know jesus and they'll say judge not lest you be judged probably one of the only verses most people in the world know and it says but what's interesting is they've got a part of it right we're not supposed to be critical or judgmental but i mean you can judge the fruit the bible says that if they're involved in adultery or they're they're sitting there with a needle you know they're not right with god because they don't love they don't love jesus if they did they wouldn't be doing those things doesn't matter if they're robbing a bank or sleeping around they're both wrong. They both show that they don't love Jesus. And 
He says, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with measure ye meet, it shall be measured you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And the next verse, Give not that which is holding to the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet, and turn again and rend you. God wants us to stop looking at everyone around us, at all their faults, their failures. That's why you know sometimes they're like, God revealed to me their wicked heart, or what's wrong with them? No, 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 no. He wants to help you, because you're a mess. He says, give, he says, God wants us to stop looking at the faults of others, but deal with our own heart, that then we can help others and not be mocked as hypocrites. Then we can be light and sought because we're, we're looked at the mirror so much that the reflection of Jesus is now shining in us. We're so seasoned with Jesus and his word that we can sprinkle salt all over people. Matthew 7, verse 7, it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. So what are we asking for? We're asking to stop being hypocrites. We're asking to have a heart cleansed and purified before God. He says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh of my will, of my nature, of my character, of my will, he will receive. He that seeketh, findeth. And him that knocketh, it shall be opened unto us. God will help us if we seek him. He wants to free of us our sin and hypocrisy. And it says, or what man is there of whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? He says, therefore, all things whatsoever you would do, that men should do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophet. He says, I'm going to reveal to you a place where you'll come to, where the true thing is, if you want people to have love for you, you need to love others. You want kindness, you need to give kindness. He says, this is where I want to take you. He says, God is a good God, and he wants to give you the nat- his nature and character. Luke 12, 30, 32, and it says, for all these things, he's talking about how they all pursue money and the things of this world. He says, that, that's what they seek after. And your father knows you need food and clothing and the things to survive. He says, He'll take care of that. But he says, but rather seek you the kingdom of God or you could bring righteousness, peace, and joy. He, seek Jesus. Seek his word. Seek his will. Seek his nature and character. He says, and all these things that you have need of shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you love, to give you kindness, to give you peace, to give you joy, to give you long suffering, to give you patience, to give you the nature and character of Jesus Christ. And then Second Peter 1, 2-4, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God, the ability to overcome the, that peace that passes all understanding, you know, uh, that, that no matter what happens, we're always trusting and believing in Him. He says, comes from the Word of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. He says, that you may have this divine power, that you may have his nature, that you may have grace, that you may have peace. We are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you might be our partakers of the divine nature or the divine code, the divine programming, divine, being a new creature in Christ, having escaped the corruption or the darkness or the wickedness that's in the world through lust. The flesh is like, I want that, I need that. And God's like, no, 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 that's not going to help you. It's going to lead you astray. And then this scripture verse, a lot of people know, enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go therein, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be to find it. The way to heaven is narrow, and requires us to work to God to deal with our hearts, to deal with our minds, to be cleansed and washed with his word. He says, but many are too busy looking at others, or refusing to deal with their heart, not even realizing they have issues, or, or have to deal with them. Then verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs, of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Many people will come and say that the way to heaven isn't narrow and you don't have to deal with your heart or sin. 
but they desire to eat of your wealth, the covetous, or use you to glorify themselves. But the fruit they have doesn't match the nature or the words of Jesus Christ. And they shall be judged, they or anyone, because they don't produce good fruit. We shall know them and ourselves by our fruit. And then it goes on. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you because you never knew my word. You never took me. You never obeyed me. And he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There's people who, the Christians, all kinds of people say they're saved, but they don't know the will and the word of God and they don't do it. And that's what he says, depart from me, because you didn't know who I am. You didn't know me. You didn't, you didn't want to partake of what I gave you. You wanted to partake of what the world gave you. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise man which built his house upon a rock, which built his house upon, he says, those who take my word and build their life upon it will be like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains ascended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, heareth this word of mine, and does it not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the world came against you, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And they came to pass, when Jesus then these sayings, that people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So when we listen to the word of God and we build our life on it, we can't be shaken. You know, dealing, he says, we'll be like the word will be grafted in our heart to where it'll automatically come forth. You know, like the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. All of a sudden, the devil will bring a lie, the word will come out of our mouth. We'll have the shield of faith. We'll have the helmet of salvation. We'll have the, the belt of truth to keep ourselves from losing everything. You know, we'll have the, our feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace. We'll have the helmet of salvation that says, the Lord saved me from sin. Why would I want sin? God cares for me. He gave me a son. He gives me all things that pertain to life and godliness. If he, not, he, if he spared not his own son, how shall he also not with him freely give us all things? And he says, nothing will shake them. He says, and those who tell, don't take Jesus at his word and allow him to deal with their hearts are like fools who fall apart at the storms of life and end up with nothing of eternal value, including their very souls. John 15, one through four again, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, in my word. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. John seventeen fourteen through 19. I'm just going to read through some scripture verses again. I have given them thy word, and thy world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shalt keep them from the evil. They are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Sanctify them through thy truth, and let that word be engraved in their heart and their mind. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they might also be sanctified through the truth of the word of God. John 8, 31, 37. Then said Jesus those Jews who believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you will know me, then you will love me, then you will have my nature and character, then you will be my disciples, and you shall know me, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we don't have any bondage, we be Abraham's seed, and never bondage any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say unto you, if you commit sin, you will become a slave of that sin. And the slave abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, through his word, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And then we're going to end with this verse, James 1.21 again. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and subfluity of naughtiness and receive with a humble teachable spirit the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Father God, we thank you for your word. If there's any area in our lives that isn't surrendered to you, Lord, help us to surrender to you. Help us to look to you and have faith in you. Help us to take a hold of your promises and your word that we might have that your nature and your character that we may overcome, that we might be light and salt. 
This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I had a young man come to me this week. He's only 33 years old, showed up Thursday night, and I've been texting him during the service, and he's caught up in this doctrine of what they call deliverance. He thinks he's got devils. He's got to get them cast out and on and on and on. And I told him the truth. I said, listen, I, you, you ain't got devils. You're listening to them. But here's your problem. You haven't renewed your mind. You, you haven't renewed your mind you haven't hidden the word of god in your heart and and pastoring for over 40 years the the most difficult thing that i have found out as a pastor is to convince people that they've got to hide the word of god in their hearts that your spiritual maturity in christ cannot be any greater than the word of god you have taken the time to hide in your heart and we all have 24 hours in a day and, we, we, uh, and, and I know that people go to work, I understand that, but y- you, you have time to put the word of God in your heart. You got something coming into your eye gate and your gate all the time, all the time. You're the one who chooses what you're going to let come in your eye gate and your ear gate. And I had a woman who right now, she's fighting for her life. She came to me about two months ago and And she was excited. Pastor, I'm really, and she began to name all these preachers that she was listening to. And I said, listen, I said, they're going to give you information and direction. I said, but the best thing you could do is you got to take the scriptures and begin to hide them in your heart. Scriptures on healing, scriptures on on God's provision, scriptures. And so, listen, we're going to say it again. What Michael preached tonight is something but pure word. I'm telling you what's kept my children all of these years, it's the word of God in their heart. What's kept me all of these years is the word of God in my heart. You need the word of God in your heart. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And it would be the most difficult thing you will ever have to do because every devil in hell is going to fight you to keep that word out of your heart. And then you can't just hear it. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Whatever it says, whatever Jesus says, do it. And uh, so a lot of your confusion, a lot of your hurt, a lot of your pain, a lot of your sorrows, a lot of your, uh, a lot of your fuss, it, 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 they will disappear when the word of God has control of your mind. It will. It'll, it'll, I mean, I was manic depressant. The word of God in my heart and my mind. Amen. And uh, if you knew in, if you knew my background and if I was the same man, anybody with any kind of common sense would not listen to me preach. If you knew my background and if I was still the same man as I was. But you know what changed me? How many know what changed me? Jesus did. Yeah. And his word. Jesus and his word. You want to change? Uh, Smith Wigglesworth said the, the answer to all lack of faith is the word of God. That's what he said. If your faith level ain't where it should be, and I don't think any of us are, the answer is the word of God. That will bring your faith level up. Just like your car needs gas. <laughs> or maybe charging with the electric coming. <laughs> but it needs the power source. Amen. So, we, we, so we're here to pray with you. God, 